So I, I did a little research on you and, um, obviously you went to, to, to Texas A&M and you're one of the most decorated players, uh, to, to put on an Aggie uniform. Um, you've, uh, transitioned into color commentating. You play for team Mexico, um, You've traveled the world. You you work with uh, the package deal sometimes, and I found a real gem. Your YouTube channel that yes, I knew this was going to come up. I don't know how, but I like had it in the back of my head. I was like, she's going to bring it up. I don't know why. Yeah, it was it was really fun. I loved doing that. <laughs> yeah. So why did it come to an end? Like, what? Actually, let's uh, back up. What prompted it, and then okay. why did it come to an end? Well, I think the biggest thing was I wanted to start something because I was already kind of in the media world. I had worked with 12th Man Productions, who is the sports broadcasting team for A&M. And I had worked for them for about a year and a half at the point. And I was like, you know what? There is nothing that kind of shows you truly what an athlete's life is like. And I remember they put out something uh, where they were like following a football player around and it was like all these really cool things that they had to do during the day. And I was like, that is not what we do. Like, <laughs> It's just so far from the truth. So I was like, you know what, I, I'm going to start something and do it. And I, I had talked to all my teammates and I was like, what do you guys think? You think that would be cool to show everyone? They're like, yeah, like, let's do it thinking that they're going to be in like every video and they're like, I'm all for it. And I talked to coach Evans about it and she was like, I think that would be a great idea. And so as soon as I was like in, I had all these ideas and I was just like going for it. And it actually, I had to talk about it at the uh, world series. When we went in 2017, we did each team did a Q and a, and you had one person from each team go up on the stage. They asked you a couple questions and our SID who I'm really good friends with. He like put it in there and he was like, tell her, ask her about vlogging with Vidalis. And I was like, Oh my gosh, I'm really doing this in front of everybody at the women's college world series. Solid. But, Mm -hmm. uh, the, the best thing that came from that was whenever I graduated and moved on to sec network, uh, Sean Wyman, who was the talent coordinator for ESPN and everything and such. And he, told me that he went to go look for me on the internet to find like some interviews or something just to see me in front of the camera. And he said, you want to know what's funny? And I was like, uh, do I? And he's like, yeah, well, I was looking for some interviews and the only thing I could find was your vlogging with the Dallas house tour. And I was like, <laughs> oh my gosh, you're joking. And he was like, no, but it was good because I got to see you in front of the camera. You're very bubbly. You, you know how to talk to the camera. Like you weren't, um, I guess, nervous or anxious or look like you didn't want to be there and you did it on your own. And that shows me that you have an interest in this side of the business and all this stuff. So I'm like, Oh wow. I thought about deleting them a couple of times. Cause I was like, do I really want this out there? And then I was like, you know what? Whatever. Like it was a part of my <laughs> life and it was so much fun and I loved it. And I think there's some really cool stuff on there. And I think if I would have went forward with it, it was just so much work. And I think that was the biggest thing why I didn't keep doing it was I had to shoot every single video. So I had to bring my camera with me everywhere I went Yeah, and I had to have it on. And a, a lot of people act different around the camera. So you like pull it up and they like, they get really awkward and they're not them, their truest self. So then it becomes almost like staged in a way. And then after I filmed it, I had to sit down and edit it and put it all together and upload it and tag it and all these things. So it, it was a lot of work for me, especially being in school, being an athlete. And then it transitioned into summer and I was like, I'm not doing anything fun. Like, what do I, what do I put out there? You know? So I think it was just a lot of just timing and busy and I wish I would have done it more, but I'm, I'm happy with the ones that I put out. It was mm-hmm. fun. What do you, what do you feel like you've uh, taken away from that experience? The vlogging? Yeah. Oh, man, just how much work goes into it. Like, I have such an appreciation for anybody, really, in media, especially, like, Flow Softball, when you look at all the videos, people are like, oh, cool, like, Mary Nutter's coming up, what a cool video, but they don't realize, like, how much went into that, like, (laughs) getting the pictures, editing stuff out of the background, like, putting those effects on there, and uh, slicing it all together. It's just so much work. It's so tedious, and 
that is a huge thing. Like to be in this business, you have to be very detail oriented and you have to be very focused and disciplined to get it done. So I think that's the biggest part is I'm usually in front of the camera, but I also have an idea of what goes on behind it. So mm -hmm. yeah, that's definitely good moving forward for me. <laughs> yeah, it's de it, it definitely takes a lot of work. And, um, you know, when people are like, oh, well, this should be free. And it's, I really struggle with that because it's just, like you said, the amount of time, the amount of effort, mm -hmm. uh, the amount of coordination, like for us yes. and, and doing um, any kind of film, we have to coordinate with the athletes, with the coaches, and there's time mm -hmm. constraints around that. And you guys have your own obligations. And like, I'm trying to turn this 15 to 20 minute interview into this grandiose piece, which is yeah. always a challenge. But I also uh, really, really like that. And mm -hmm. um, it's so cool that you were able to kind of put yourself out there because that's probably the, the most frightening thing. Do you remember your first game you ever color commented and kind of walk um, me through how you felt that day? <laughs> it was at A&M? Oh my gosh. Well, yeah, so I... So right now, I guess I shouldn't say right now, RIP NCAA sports, but um, the first game I called was with the 12th Man Productions, which I only called on the SEC Plus. So it wasn't like on TV or anything, but people could pull it up and listen to me. Like I'm sure a lot of people have watched those games, but I was calling with um, a girl that I've known who called the games whenever I was there. And I've known her for quite a while. We did a couple interviews. Her name is Chelsea Reber. And uh, we, <laughs> I remember coming in and I'm like, so what are we doing here two hours early? Like, what do we do? And she was like, well, you know, we got to get all the stats and we have to write in our lineups and all this stuff. And so I'm like, just kind of sitting there, like twiddling my thumbs. Like I was like, yeah, sounds good. Like I'm just here to talk about some softball. <laughs> and I had no idea like the preparation that went into it. And of course I, I had uh, talked to the coaches on the teams and researched up on the girls and all this stuff, but I'm just like sitting there and I'm like, well, I mean, I, I don't really talk about stats a lot or do any of the really in-depth stuff or find cool stories. And so I was just like sitting there waiting and I wasn't really nervous, which was the weird thing, but I think it was because I had experience obviously in the game and just talking about the game and listening to people, other people call the games, but it is so much harder than people make it, make it seem like Amanda Scarborough and Danielle Laurie, Kayla bro, all those, all those girls who call have, have called games and played games. They make it sound so easy. And when you get in there, you don't realize one, how many times you like repeat some of the same words. Like uh, I remember Meg, who's the coordinator for softball at ESPN. She had called me and she was listening to one of my games. It wasn't the first one, but she was listening to one of my games. And she said, I want you to go back and listen and make a tally for every time you said right there or right here. And I was like, oh, gosh, OK. And I did it. And it was like 40 something times. Wow. And I was just sitting there like, what? Who like who says that that often, you know, and you just find little things and um, things that you wouldn't notice unless somebody else tells you. But the first game, I didn't, I did not know anything about how to call a game. I just knew I talk about the game. And luckily, a man Scarborough actually called me before my first game. And she was like, Hey, like, I know you're calling your first games this weekend. Just wanted to call and give you a couple tips, things that I didn't know whenever I first started. Um, and I'm hoping that this will help you. And I was like, yes, that would be awesome. And she was like, okay, well, you are basically, um, never supposed to talk over the pitch. Um, and I was like, really? And she was like, yeah, because if, if they hit the ball, the, the, um, play by play has to be able to describe what's going on and you never want to make it seem like they cut you off in a sentence or, or whatever that may be. And I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then she talks about how you have every replay as a, as a color commentator, you talk about the replay and you break it down and don't go too much into detail, but kind of give it the, just the average softball player, uh, instruction or breakdown of the play and like all these things I had no idea. So I'm like going in thinking I'm like really prepared and I, I wasn't nervous until we started doing the open right before and you kind of rehearse it. So, you know, what's going on with timing with the people in the control room and everything. And 
as soon as they were like, okay, we're live in five, four. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm sweating. <laughs> <laughs> and luckily it, tur- it turned out okay. It turned out a lot better than I thought it was going to. And, um, I just thought about it as if I was playing the game, what would I see and what I'm watching? What would I do? What do I think when I'm breaking down this picture about her pitch sequence or why is this swing look so good? And I kind of just take it as it, as it came to me and it became a lot easier as you had practice and as you get feedback from other people and it's turned out to be something that I really, really enjoy. And I hope that I can do for a really long time. Mm -hmm. Do you remember listening to yourself that first time that first go around? I, that, I think that game, it was a game against Alabama. It was when A&M snapped the 37 and 0 streak yeah, uh, last year. <laughs> and I remember going back and I was like, wow, this is such a good game. Like I had never seen it before. And, uh, I, that was the first time I watched the entire game. And I think after that game, I realized, oh, wow, I should probably do that, do this after every game and go back and listen and figure it out. But it's so weird. You know how they say like when you record your voice and then you listen back, you're like, Oh, do I sound like that? But, uh, I think Chelsea Reber, who was calling the game with me, her voice is so much different than mine. Uh, hers is like a lot higher. So it makes mine seem a lot lower. And I'm like, is my voice really that low? Or <laughs> am I crazy? So it was just weird to hear your own voice, but I'm like, Oh, Hey, that was good. Oh, Ooh, I need to clean that one up or Hey, you need to go into more detail here. But I remember listening and I was like, is that, is that me? Are we sure that's me? (laughs) Yeah. I think, um, what's interesting about it is, uh, for the first time in probably a long time, you have to kind of self coach yourself. Um, I mean, you mentioned getting help from Amanda and Meg, Mm -hmm. but at the same time, it's like, they're not doing that for you after every game. And, uh, no <laughs> busy people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, talk about, uh, your experience at Texas A&M and, and what was it like to play for coach Evans? Oh man, such a loaded question just because I feel like I could never ever create a paragraph or even like I could write a novel about like what I've learned at A&M or what I did learn at A&M and, just still being around the program and living so close and being in contact with coach Evans and just all the things that she's taught me throughout the way. But I think the biggest thing is just playing there and understanding like you have to respect the game. And that's a big thing that coach Evans teaches is you respect the game and it respects you back. And when I got there, I, I thought I knew what respecting the game was, you know, my dad played baseball, my mom played softball. So for me, it was, it was a little bit different coming into it. I had an idea of what that was, but then there's little things that she talks about such as doing it all in the little detail. So getting that the right amount of sleep, um, not going out and partying on the weekends and, uh, taking care of your body and running out of play or pop up to first base, running it all the way through first, trying to get to second. There's little things that a lot of coaches I'm sure teach, but the way she, relays that message to you I feel like is unmatched and she has such great character just a great person all around and she really cares about you as a person rather than a player and I think a lot of times I can't speak for every other program but a lot of coaches I know really only talk about softball and that's it and I remember having a meeting with her talking about hey what do you want to do after like after school and I was only a sophomore I was like what do you mean I still have two years here like what are you talking about coach? And she was like, you know, I just want to make sure like you're prepared for the real world. Like obviously this ends eventually. And I just want to make sure that you have a good grip on reality and uh, life after softball and all these things. And I was like, wow, she made me really think about what do I want to do? And am I, am I going down the right track? And it was crazy because we sat there. I look, I looked down at my watch and it was, I think it was one of my exit meetings and I looked down and we were supposed to have 30 minute time slots. <laughs> I looked down and it was an hour and 30 minutes. We had been in there and I'm like, Oh my gosh, we set everybody behind. It's going to be such a long day, but it, the time just went by so fast. Cause we talked about everything. We talked about my family. We talked about school. I remember one time she asked me about a boy that was in the stands and I was like, coach. <laughs> <laughs> she was like, I'm just curious. Cause uh, Rob Williams, who was at a and he plays for the Celtic, Boston Celtics now. He w- we were good friends, and he was in the stands a lot. And she was like, 
do you know who he's here for? And I was like, oh, yeah, like we're good friends. And she was like, oh, yeah, I remember this one softball player who came here and got into that crowd. And she was like, be careful. And I was like, no, (laughs) we're not dating. We are not dating, coach. She's like, okay. And then we just like go on and on and on. But I think that's the biggest thing is even after I know that I could text her and anything I needed, she'd be there and she'd be there in like 10 minutes and let me know exactly what I need to do moving forward, who I need to contact, where I need to go. And I think that's a big thing is just having that sense of family. She's almost like your second mom when you're there, which is nice because, I mean, a lot of us weren't super far from home, but now they're getting a lot more out of state commits and recruits and and such so just her being there for you in in both senses as a coach and just like almost as a second parent is was really a game changer for me yeah so why did you pick the number eight? Oh, um so growing up i was number four and i say growing up i was like maybe eight or nine for like two years and then my brother was always number eight And I remember four and two, I think, were already chosen on my new team. And I was like, well, I don't know what number to be. And my dad's like, be 29. That's my number. My mom's like, oh, be 11. That's my number. And I'm like, I'm not picking between you two. Like, I'm just going to pick number eight because Josh is number eight. And from then on, it just became like a thing. Like, we were both number eight. And it was funny because we were completely different players like he is like super quick and agile and like a gap to gap contact hitter he can lay down a bunt and me over here can't lay down a bunt and not very fast but (laughs) he stole bases and all this stuff and I'm over here like I'll just hit a home run so I can jog and he's like no I want to get a triple and I'm like I know that's a lot (laughs) a lot of running (laughs) but yeah it just kind of became like a family thing and at one point my mom like got a shirt and it had like an eight, but it had U of H on one side and A and M on the other. And it was really cool just to see like, that was kind of our way of staying connected, even though we were at different schools and not the same age, but it was cool. Cause uh, we actually got tattoos. Our senior class got tattoos of our numbers and just kind of something that sticks with me all the time. My number eight. Uh, what, what sports did your parents play? Oh gosh. Um, so <laughs> my mom did pretty much everything under the moon. She is, well, I guess my brother is like an identical copy of her. Like she's incredibly fast. She's little. Um, actually she's shorter. I don't want her to hear me say that, but, <laughs> um, <laughs> she's, she's shorter. Um, she did track. Uh, she actually played college basketball at Blinn, Blinn mm-hmm. college, which is in uh, Brenham down the road from College Station. Um, She did softball. She played uh, volleyball. And she actually set a record at our high school. She always says this. She says, yeah, you know, I set the 100 100 meter, was it 100 yard personal best or whatever for track. So like a personal best, but it's like an all-time record. She's like, yeah, no one will ever beat it. And I was like, wow, mom, that's bold. Like, okay. And she was like, well, no, because the next year they switched to meters. So literally no one can ever break it. (laughs) I was like, ah, clever. Yeah, Yeah, right. And then um, my dad, he played basketball and football. I'm pretty sure those are the only two. But he went to Texas Tech, played baseball back in the 80s. And yeah, very athletic family. For yeah. Sure. When, when you, when you think about both of your parents, uh, what do you think is the, the key traits that you've taken from them? Oh man, this is crazy because I think about this all the time. I'm like, dad, what do you think I'm more like you or more like mom? <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I think sports wise, I, I was definitely more like my dad. Um, and him or him and I were kind of like one in the same, like we have the same stance and we have almost the same, I don't want to say injuries, but like we'll have the same stuff nagging us and we'll just be like, ah, we'll both move our shoulders. And he's like, is it right here? Like in the top of your shoulder? And I'm like, yes, is yours. He's like, man, mine's hurting there too. And I'm like, why, why are you like this? Like you are the same person as me. But, um, he's very patient and just like, um, easygoing and, he doesn't get worked up very often. And I think when I'm playing sports, that's definitely how I approached it. Like I was always just trying to have a good time and, um, be 
I guess having fun playing the game and my mom is more like I'm gonna like rip your head off like so it's like a perfect balance of the two uh but it's funny now that I'm out of school and back at home with them I'll like catch myself doing stuff and I'm like whoa I sounded just like my mother (laughs) and we share like um I don't want to say office space, but she has her desk and then I have my desk and we'll both like sit in here and like work or uh, actually my makeup and everything is in here too, but I'll like be getting ready and I'm like, Hey, you organize your, your stuff like that. And she's like, yeah, where do you think you got it from? And I was like, okay, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, definitely my mom is like the I don't want to say temper because she doesn't have a temper. I'm like looking to make sure. She's not sure. She doesn't yeah, she's get not mad. Sure. She's awesome. <laughs> she's beautiful. Right. Um, but she's very like, I'm going at you. Like mm-hmm. I'm taking you out. My dad's very like, I'm chill. I'm going to beat you, but I'm not going to talk about it. Like, well, well, let's go. And I'm like, wow, perfect, perfect balance. <laughs> I love it. Um, talk a little bit about your team Mexico experience. Um, when did you try out? What was that tryout like? And what's your journey been like since? Man, it's been crazy. I think <laughs> the funny thing is, is we've been through so much. And just now that we've like qualified for the Olympics and everything, people are starting to like want to come play with us and all this stuff. And we're like, man, you weren't here when we were shooting in the gym, you know, like <laughs> we, we literally, this is, a little off topic, but we, we went to a tournament and we were eating meals out of a crock pot. Like we didn't have money to go get food. We had to eat something that was like given to us. We ate rice and beans for, I think three days, all three meals. And it was just so like, you look back now and we're like, we're getting uniforms like (laughs) from Nike. What? Like, and so it's all these things that just kind of come up and I, I laugh looking back, but my first year with them was 2016 I went I think it was December because it was Christmas break and tried out in California they had a huge tryout there was a ton of girls there and they had reached out the year before but I wasn't able to get my citizenship that quickly because our the pitching coach Carlos Caro he reached out in probably in May and they started in June so there was no way because it takes a long time to get it but um, we tried out and I actually tried out with Anissa Urtez. She was, um, basically like everything she did, I did at the same time. So like we were like one in the same in that aspect, but I tried out and I remember, uh, George Araujo from Fullerton. Oh my gosh. I didn't know that was her uncle, but, uh, at the time. And I was like, God, this guy is firing these ground balls at us. Like, so hard like it was, it was like a grown man hit like taking bp at us and <laughs> all these girls like not all of them were um like in college some of them were in high school some of them were old enough like my age but they weren't playing college but there were some that weren't very good and they couldn't get in front of the ball and i cannot tell you how many shin like busted open shins and Oh man, it was brutal. I was like, I'm next. I can feel it. I'm yeah. next. <laughs> but um, we tried out and then they they brought a couple people back the next day. Were your parents with you um, at the North American qualifier? <clears throat> and kind of like take me through that that experience of realizing like you guys are going to the Olympics. Yeah, they actually were fortunate enough to come. Uh, That was the first tournament they had been to for Mexico in a long time. My first two summers, they came to Oklahoma City. And then, obviously, we play, like, out of the country, so they're not going to come watch all those games. It would be, oh, (laughs) my (laughs) computer fell. Um, So they weren't going to come to every single tournament, but they were like, we're coming to this tournament. And I was like, okay, like, awesome, like, let's do it. And a lot of the parents came, but... I remember when the, fir- the um, what is it, the schedule first came out of, like, the sides of the, the bracket, and we were just, dur- it was in the fall, so we were, we didn't really know what was going on, like, how it worked yet, and so, but we noticed that we weren't on the same side as Canada or Puerto Rico, which was good for us, so we were like, yes, finally we caught a break, 
Um, and then <clears throat> when we got to Cleveland for, or I guess I should say Chicago, when we were playing the bandits, we were talking with our coaches about how it was going to work and how the setup was. And basically they said, okay, you play everyone on your side and then the top three advance. And then you have to win two out of three games to qualify. And I was like, okay, so we have to beat Canada and Puerto Rico. And they're like, no, we only have to beat one of them. And at the time we, we know we're good and we know that obviously Canada's put ahead of us and we, we know that we can compete with them, but it's always kind of like a toss in the air. Which team are we going to get from us? Like, are we going to be there and like really put up a fight or is it going to be kind of like, are we going to like lay down and let them kind of go over us? So it's always like for us, we get a little bit nervous or I say should, or in the past, we got a little bit nervous whenever we would talk about it. Like, Oh, like we know we can beat them, but like at the same time, it's going to be really tough. And um, so we finally get to the qualifier and we're all excited. Like we're staying in a great hotel and we're all together. And we went to Peru before for the Pan American games and we played like garbage. Like it was bad. Like it was so bad. We had been together the whole summer and you know, when you just get to that point where you're like, I can't stand you guys anymore. Like, don't breathe around me. Don't look at me. <laughs> just like one of those things. And our coaches were like freaking out and prove they're like, what, like, what do we do? Like, what do we need to do to get you guys going? And Sachelle Palacios, our catcher was just like, look, I think you guys just need to let us go home be with our people for about a week and a half. And just kind of decompress. And I promise like we will come back better than ever. And I don't know what happened. It was like a switch. Um, we came to Canada and we were just all like so excited to just be together. Like we hadn't seen each other for like a year and we were having so much fun and we were like all dancing at the opening ceremonies and we were playing hacky sack and we were all, it was just a great time. And we, we knew that we were excited to see each other, but we were like, okay, how are we going to play? Like, how is this going to translate on the field? And we come out and we run rule a bunch of the teams in our, in our side of the bracket. Uh, we played Peru, Brazil, uh, Venezuela, Cuba. So we had, or no Cuba, we played them later, but we had a bunch of teams that we played and we played very well against them. And we were just like firing on all cylinders. And when we look back at it, when we were in Peru, nothing was going our way. Like we had hits that would fall for the other team in just the perfect spot. And we would have bunts that would roll fat or roll fair for them. And it's just like, we couldn't get any like single little tiny break and we get to Canada and it was just like, everything went our way. And we got into the first game against Puerto Rico. And that was the game that was kind of our, be all end all. If we could beat Puerto Rico, we knew that we were going to go to the Olympics because we had to play Puerto Rico, Canada, Cuba. We only had to win two of those. So we know, we knew that we could beat Cuba and we were like, all right, we either have to make it easy on ourselves and beat Puerto Rico, or we have to really put up a fight and beat Canada. And we go into that game, almost got my head taken off in the first inning, uh, by Carson and she hits a line drive passing. I'm like, oh gosh, I hope this isn't any indication of how this game is going to go. <laughs> um, there was a controversial play at the plate in the first inning. And it was just like, oh my gosh, this is going to be a whirlwind. But as the game goes on, we had like great defensive plays and everything was just kind of like breaking our way. And we sat down in the middle of that game and, and Sachelle looked at us and she was like, do you guys realize like, things are going our way this, this tournament. Like, I think this is, this is our time. We were like, yeah, like this is our time. Like we all kind of like rallied together. They were like, yeah, like this is it. This is it. And so we, we end up winning that game and it was like really tight at the end. They hadn't had a runner on third since the first inning. And I think it was the sixth inning. Uh, we had a really good defensive double play and got out of it. And then the seventh inning, Dow was it Dallas? No, it was Thule. Thule just like mowed him down and it was just like, what? Like, did that just happen? And so we were all, as soon as we won the game, we like felt, we felt it. Like we were like, we're going to the Olympics. Like, oh my gosh, like what is going on? But we couldn't, we couldn't celebrate because. Yeah. You still had to play Canada. Yeah. We still had to play Canada and Cuba. So like mm -hmm. we technically weren't even qualified at all, but we knew that we could beat Cuba and that was still two days away. So 
we go into Canada the next day and, you know, we weren't super anxious about it because we knew that we didn't have to win. It wasn't like do or die, but we want, we wanted to win. Absolutely. And we go into the game and Dallas is pitching and she hadn't seen them all summer because she was, um, playing in Japan. And then she came and played with scrapyard instead of playing with us in the MPF. So it kind of worked out for us, but obviously her being our ace and their lineup just being absolutely stacked. We were, we were pretty confident that she could get it done, but they took an early lead. This was one of the most fun games and I didn't even do anything. Like it was just (laughs) awesome. Like it was so much fun. I was sitting in the dugout and, uh, they started Sarah G and she was just mowing us down that change up. She's just like, pull the string. You thought like, and, um, I forgot who it was, but they got on base. There's a couple people that got on base and, it was one to zero bases were loaded and they bring in Jenna Kyra and also has a dirty changeup. And, uh, Susie Gonzalez was up and she hadn't faced her as much because she is still in college. So I, I walked up to her as they made the pitching change and I was like, okay, listen, if it comes out of her hand low, it's a ball. It has to come out of her hand high and it'll drop in. She's like, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> and she puts up, such a fight like it was a battle and she gets to three two and she throws a change up that was like almost going to be a strike and it was the latest swing I've ever seen in my life like it was like it was already in the catcher's glove and she kind of just like dink knocked it out and just was like foul ball like and we were like going crazy in the dugout and uh she throws a change up and she like holds on her front foot and it bounces in the dirt and we're like going crazy like a walk tied up the game so we're like going crazy in the dugout. And then we realize um, Nicole Mendez is up. So, and she was hitting really well that tournament. And so we were like, yes, like we're going to go ahead. Like we're going to do it. And we we're like, even if we don't, we still tied it up. That's a huge accomplishment. We'll go into extras. We'll fight it out. And she gets a hit through the five, six hole. And we're just like going crazy, like throwing helmets and everything in the <laughs> dugout. Like it was so hype. And, um, so we end up having a 2-1 lead, and we go to the 7th, and Dallas again. Like, her, Dallas and Sechelle, when they're, when that battery, like, unmatched. Like, they just know each other so well, and they're on the same wavelength that it's just seamless. And I have so much confidence in them that they're going to get it done because they just, like, it's just weird. They know each other so well, and it's just like, boom, boom, I want to throw this pitch, this pitch. And they're so smart that they're able to trust their instincts and, and really just hunker down, but we struck their mouth. And as soon as that happened, I was like, I ran, I was like, I don't even know who to hug right now. I'm so (laughs) excited. Like we just qualified for the freaking Olympics. What is going on? And so we all run to each other and we're all just like looking at each other. We're all crying and we're so excited. And then I remember going into the stands cause they kind of like opened the door for us. Cause all the cameras and everything just kind of paparazzi us. And, um, we go into the stands and I just remember hugging my mom and my mom is just like, Oh, like heaving, like just like so excited. She's like, it all paid off. It all paid off. And I think the, the biggest thing for us was just the journey to get there. Like we knew we were good, but we had been through so much stuff and like within the team and outside of the team, it was just, it kind of like all finally came together and something like finally went our way. And all of the hard work that we did put in and all really the suffering that we did <laughs> just like with, with everything, like it was just like travel would always go bad or like food. We didn't always know what we were going to be eating. And I think the difference, if you look at like somebody like USA who has a ton of money and like you would expect them to do these things, like people would count us out because maybe they think we're not as talented or maybe we just didn't have the resources to be at that level. And we we got past all of it. And I think that was the biggest thing is we really fought through that adversity. And we finally realized like after all this time and like all this crap, like we did it. Mm -hmm. And I remember hugging my dad and I started just like bawling. Like it just all came out. And I was like, this is surreal. I cannot believe it. And I looked at Sachelle. I actually have a picture on my phone. I was like hugging her cause she FaceTimed her sister Charlize Um, and she was like, we qualify, like, oh my gosh. And I'm like hugging her and like talking to Shar on the phone. And one of the photographers got that and it was on the front page of the 
newspaper in Canada that next day. And we actually got to find one and keep it. So nice. It was awesome. And then so the next day we come into Cuba, we're just like so happy. Like we don't even care. We're like, whatever, like, let's go. <laughs> it was like show and go. And uh, we didn't show and go. We actually warmed up. But <laughs> we <laughs> we actually ended up, I think, run rolling them in six innings. And it was it was just madness. I could not believe it. And then everyone, so all the teams were staying at the same hotel except for Canada. I swear everyone stayed up till like 3 a.m. And our bus left at like 3.15. And I was just like sitting there like with my head in my hands, just like staring at the ground. I'm like, oh, my gosh, that really happened. Like I was like, wake up, wake up. <laughs> But everyone was going crazy. All the parents that were there were like partying with us and we like bought pizza and we're just by the pool and just hanging out all night. It was it was fun to celebrate. I'm just glad that everybody was there and it all finally turned out and honestly it was like a big weight off your chest. Like it's fine like that's what we had been working for for so long. And it can either end in tremendous sadness or a huge victory and luckily for us that time it was it was a victory. Mm -hmm. Ooh, crazy. Can we dig into, I feel like the big turning point for you guys was Peru mm -hmm. and the time away. Um, and in looking back on it, it kind of needed to happen. Mm -hmm. It did. Uh, and uh, why do you think that, that the low point of Peru was so important? And why do you think the, the, the time away from each other was so crucial um well I think it was just kind of like we hadn't been home all summer because we played with the MPF the Cleveland Comets all summer so from June 5th until August I don't even know what day that was beginning of August we were gone and I hadn't seen my parents I hadn't slept in my own bed like I was in a hotel for 70 plus days in a row and it's just something about getting home, being in your own environment and being with your people and just relaxing and knowing that I don't need to practice anymore. I just need to just kind of decompress. My body knows exactly what I need to do. But the way we lost in Peru, oh, tough. So we, we actually lost to Puerto Rico in Peru. So that's why that next game in Canada was so important for us. But we lost in the bottom of the seventh inning, we were up two to one with two outs and one of their girls came up and hit a freaking home run dead center. We lost the game just like that. And we were like, Oh my God, did that just happen? And it was like, we all felt like it was our fault. Like, cause we all just felt like we didn't do enough. And I know Dallas was like torn up. She's like, I will never let that happen again. Like that is not who I am as a competitor. Like, I'm going to get this done for you. I'm going to go. I'm going to practice my butt off. Like I'm going to go and I'm going to do all of it. And I think that kind of made us like realize like this shouldn't be all on her. Like there's no way that that's her fault. Like we didn't do enough as hitters and whoa, sorry. I, I uh, blacked out for a second. <laughs> um, oh, your uh, video froze for some oh. reason again. Ready? Come on. Better. There we go. Yeah. Back. <laughs> I don't know what happened. But, um, yeah, I just, I think that it made us realize, like, we need to step up. Like, Dallas has had our back for so long. Like, we would never be in any of this without Dallas. And she's been a, such a huge part and such a huge rock for our team that we knew it was time for, like, us to give back to her. Like, all the pitchers knew that they needed to work harder and really refine those pitches and really just get out of our heads. We... I think we're thinking so much and like we just kind of expected like, Oh, you know, we've been playing together all summer. We're going to do fine. Like, but it didn't come down to that. It came down to like mentally, where are you at and how are you dealing with the game and stuff outside of the game? So being able to go home and then just realize like, Hey, I miss, I miss my friends. Like I miss my teammates. Um, we were able to just really enjoy it. And we realized like, Hey, this could be our last time ever playing together because a lot of the girls aren't going to play if we don't qualify, like where are we going to go, you know, for our tournaments and what's going to matter next year. So. 
something I just want to latch on to something you, you yeah. talked about. Um, it seems like when, and this is, and you can probably reflect on this a little bit more, but um, when the joy seemingly like gets taken out of like what mm-hmm. you do, don't you feel like all the flow what? of everything, like it mm-hmm. doesn't go your way. And when you kind of let go of that, and it's not for a lack of effort, right? I'm sure when you guys right. were in Peru, everyone's working hard. They're all, it's just like, there's like almost this kind of, um, uh, I don't want to say like negative energy, but yeah, no, there a, was. It's, a, a it's like, a t- it's a tense energy that builds up and then it's like collective between everybody and then yeah. nothing goes your way. And then when you guys went back and experienced joy again, uh, in your personal life, you will, you were able to bring that positive energy to to Canada and yes. it was just vibing, you know? Yeah, and- we were vibing so <laughs> hard when we got to Canada. It was awesome. Like now that I think back about on it, but yeah, I mean, when we were in Peru, it's, it was their winter at the time. So like we had just come from summer and seeing the sun every day. We saw the sun one time when we were there for two weeks. Oh boy. So it's just like so dreary and it's cold. Like it was freezing. We had to wear sweats every single day because we didn't have enough cold clothes because we didn't bring them to Cleveland whenever we moved there. Cause we're like, Hey, it's summer. We won't need sweats or anything cold. But so it was just like gross outside and we had been together for so long and everything was going wrong. So we were all just kind of like in our, in our fields. Like we were just like yeah. mad at the world, you know? And it's like, like everyone, said, everyone's on their period. <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty much, pretty much. And it's funny because now that I look back on, I'm like, why were we so mad? Like we would have so much fun in like our little, we had, I think how many people, six people in a room and we would have fun like in our rooms and then we would go out to the field and it would just be like, Oh, here we go again. What's going to happen today. That's going to make us just feel like crap, Mm -hmm. you know? And, uh, I think that was a huge thing is it it gets really tough. The game gets really tough when you're not enjoying it. And I think we just kind of like let it all go. And we had like a big, team not a meeting but after one of our practices we kind of just all got together and talked about why we were there and like why do we represent Mexico and why do we love playing for this team and it all came back to like we love it because of the girls like we wouldn't be here without each other and we love playing with each other and we've been a lot of us have been in this journey for a long time and we realized like hey this tournament could be the last time we ever play together like as Mexico and I think that kind of really kicked our butts like kicked it to us like we got down to business and we realized like hey let's just have fun like who cares if we lose like at least we lose having fun you know and then from that moment on it was just like a breath of fresh air we were having fun everybody was seeing success and we were able to just be loose and not have to worry about like like being super tight and tense and like oh I have to get a hit I have to get a hit and just all these plays started coming out of nowhere and we're like whoa like so this is what it's supposed mm-hmm. to be like. It's the flow and, of the universe. Oh my gosh, it's crazy. <laughs> and we talked about that all the time. We're like, why do we suck right now? What, like, what's going on in Peru? And then we kind of piece it all together in Canada. We're like, we're just having fun. You know, we're yeah. just enjoying the game as it is. Amazing. It's crazy. Um, <laughs> and uh, just staying on the topic of, of Team mm-hmm. Mexico, have you guys, I know you mentioned that You've been training on your own, but have, have there been any additional uh, setbacks for, for you guys um, during this time? Because I know that the NPF season, um, well, opening day and the draft have uh, been postponed, but we could potentially see more schedule changes. Yeah, so we actually had two trips coming up. One actually was supposed to leave on Sunday to go to San Diego. We were going to play San Diego State. University of San Diego and then we were going to drive to Arizona and we were going to play BYU um, Arizona and uh, those were going to be big games for us and I think I mean obviously no way we'd be able to play now since the NCAA canceled well I know SEC canceled theirs didn't Pac-12 cancel all canceled most of them canceled yeah I mean so we pretty much knew that we weren't going to be able to go there and the only thing that is is hard on I think everyone right now is not being able to see those live reps and um 
th- those games were going to be huge for us, not only like in the box, but just like being together, finding that chemistry. And um, then we had another trip in April to play uh, Canada in Fresno State or at Fresno State, and that's canceled too. Um, so that's another opportunity to see a team that we will be playing in Tokyo. So we always want to take every opportunity we have to see those teams that we will face. But I think just the biggest setback is not being able to see each other and find time to like bond off the field too, because we were going to have uh, San Diego is where Sachelle Palacios lives. So we were going to do like a taco truck and like at her house and like everyone get together and, some of the parents were going to come and it was just going to be like a cool, chill night, like make a fire or whatever. And so those are just as important as the games for us. And, um, yeah, I think that's the hardest thing, but just not being able to see your competition that you will face. And right now finding places to train mm-hmm. since a lot of places are closing down. And, um, luckily a lot of the girls have places that they can train. Like I know people have cages. Some of them have cages in their backyards or like a facility that is staying open for just them or whatever it may be. But I can't even get on the high school field at here at La Porte, <laughs> So I'm like, I need a tee and a, a, a net and we're going back to the old days. So I need one of those pop-up nets that you like yeah, throw. <laughs> totally. Yeah. <laughs> um, Serious question. Uh, yeah. What's what's your favorite Mexican food and favorite me- Mexican restaurant? Ooh. Yeah, Taffy. Uh, there's so many options. Um, I would say before I like, started playing with Mexico, I would say tamales was like my number one. But now that I've been cultured, you know, in, uh, in Mexican food, chilaquiles uh, with the yeah. green sauce. Same. Not the red, the green. Oh. So good. With some refried beans. Oh, have you? Uh, <laughs> I think it's a TikTok where it's uh, this girl who's at a Mexican restaurant. She's like, oh, um, what are the taquitos? And this is all in Spanish. She's like, oh, uh, what's in the taquitos? She's like, oh, you know, tortilla, beans, chicken, salsa. And then um, she goes, oh, okay. And, um, and the flautas? She's like... <laughs> tortillas beans chicken <laughs> salsa <laughs> and it's like she goes on for like two more and she's like relaxing <laughs> okay it's the same thing and everything yeah. but they're all ones um yeah just different configurations so i know i need to send it to you it's hilarious yeah. um man so my favorite restaurant does it have to be like a chain no it could it could be uh it, it's just your favorite I mean, oh, okay. you can do a top three if you want, if that's There too hard. is this little tiny, like, hole-in-the-wall restaurant in the Mexico City airport. The best. <laughs> Dang it. Chilequila ever. I was like, we were stuck there for a long time. So when we came back from, or no, when we were going to Colombia two summers ago, we got stuck in the airport for like four hours. And so we were like, man, we're starving. Like we need to go find some food. And we found this place and we we're like, Hey, are you guys open? Cause it was pretty early in the morning. And they were like, yeah, we're open. Like come sit down. And mind you, this is all in Spanish. So we're like, I'm barely communicating. Sachelle's like taking the lead for us. But she, uh, she's like, yeah, like, what do you guys want? She gives us the menu and we're like, we all decide on chilaquiles. Like nobody even talked about it. We were just all ordering the same thing. Mm -hmm. And so she brings it out. And to this day, every time we go to Mexico city airport, we will go to that place. And we're like, chilaquiles with a fried egg, please. Mm -hmm. And they uh, will take pictures of it and like send it in the group me. And everyone's like, Oh, I hate you. Like, I can't believe you did that without us. And the best food I've ever tasted. So good. Do you remember the name of it or? No, it's like, it's not even like a, really like a it looks like a snack place Mm -hmm. but with a couple tables in it like our whole team couldn't even sit down in there what uh what airlines is it by oh man i can like see what the airport looks like and i know exactly where it's at but i don't know what i think it may be southwest maybe okay all right we'll see well i could uh, ask the people me while you're there i can like direct you where to okay. go i've only been in that airport once so i don't it's really have a good feeling actually yeah. it's very large and i'm like yeah i, I walked in the wrong direction 
first. Oh, plenty of times. Mm-hmm. Every time, actually, every time I'm there, I have to ask <laughs> for help. Um, what's a what's a favorite book that you would gift uh, to a friend or or family member? A book that I yeah. would gift. Ooh. And why? Mm-hmm. A book that I would gift. See, I never know. Like, so being a book person, I never know like what kind of genre my friends like or like anybody that reads likes. I would always probably suggest a thriller because I think everyone can identify with a thriller because it makes you want to know what's what's happening and you're like just so in the book. Mm-hmm. Um, man, do you have I a don't favorite, know? There's favorite a top one that comes to mind. So I haven't read this yet, but I've heard nothing but good things about it. And I love these kind of books, but it's called The Butterfly Garden. Okay. And it's about, um, it's, it's next on my list. Um, <laughs> it's about this guy who kidnaps girls and he calls them his butterflies. So he basically has them in this place that he calls the garden and one of the girls actually escapes and is like trying to catch this guy but she's she had been in uh confinement for like 13 years or something like something crazy wow. so they're like trying to find this guy and she was so little whenever she was abducted that she doesn't really remember anything about her real life she only remembers like stuff that he's told her so they're like trying to catch this guy all off the information that she's giving about her life there so I'm like super excited to read it. It's uh, The Butterfly Garden? Yes. Who's the author? Do you know? Um, I can find it right now. I like, I joined the Barnes and Noble and like everything right before the quarantine happened. So I'm like, Mm -hmm. let's go. I'm on that Audible. Oh, you like Audible? Well, I, I, I mix it up and Audible is completely dependent on the narrator. The narrator like makes or breaks it. For me, um, and I try to get my really dense books on Audible because it's hard for me to um, read them. S- yeah. Um, See, but- I think with Audible, like, I've listened to, I think, a couple. But you know what book is really good that I would probably recommend? Can't Hurt Me by David Goggins. Okay. Have you read that? No. You, Audible is a great one for that one. It's so good. Mm-hmm. Um, the Butterfly Garden by Dot Hutchinson. Okay. Awesome. But I'm a big um, page flipper. Same. I like it. So, like, I love being able to, like, read and, like, see how far I've gotten in the book. So, like, Mm -hmm. if I, like, read, I'm like, I I read this much. That's my favorite thing in the morning is uh, coffee and my book. (laughs) Hustle juice. That's what I call it. But, uh, yeah, I was actually going to go outside and read. And I'm like, yes, perfect time. Today's my off day for workout. So I'm like, let's read. And then I got my my mom every time I'll read a book. And I'm like, oh, mom is so good. She's like, oh, let me read it. Let me read it. So then she's sitting on the couch. And I'm like, what part are you at? She's like, oh, I'm at this part. And I'm like, oop, it's getting good. <laughs> she's like, I can't put it down. Uh, that's awesome. Cool. Very uh, fun quarantine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, it's a good, it's a good, uh, habit to pick up while you're in oh, quarantine. Yeah. For yeah. Sure. Um, well, thanks for joining me on my first podcast. This was fun. Yeah, no, I, I hope mean, you get if, a lot of good info. Yeah. If, uh, if you, <laughs> I probably can't go with quarantine in the title of this podcast <laughs> because you <laughs> pee pee pee. <laughs> That's a good one. What does it stand for? Quality pitches, batting practice. <laughs> Yeah, just change it. Just flip it. Yeah, just flip it depending on who you're talking to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Cool. Well, you enjoy the rest of your day. And Thank you. um, I don't know if you've had the chance to to catch the the Mexico trailer. We dropped it today. Oh, you did? I'll yeah, have to go check it um, out. And then the episode will be out on Monday. Nice. Mm-hmm. I can't wait. Yeah. I'll have, put it up on the big screen. My parents will want to watch too. <laughs> awesome. Well. <laughs> Enjoy the rest of your day. And Thank you. You too. Stay safe out there. I know.